Thanks for, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so before I get to sums of three cubes, let me just uh, brief, briefly review the situation for sums of two, uh, sums of the squares. Okay, so if we like fix an integer k, at least two, and maybe we want to know, I mean, it's well known which integers, non-negative integers say, and are sums of k squares. For example, uh, there's criteria by Fermat for sum of two squares. And this implies that the density of the you know, set of sum of two squares is zero. Um, although uh, it's kind of close to, I mean, it's only barely zero because there, the, the number of representable integers up to size n is n over log n to the one half times some constant, roughly. Um, that's due to Landau. Uh, okay, so that's kind of a borderline case. And then after that, uh, the, the so it's Gauss showed that, I mean, he determined which integers are sum of three squares, or I guess the genre maybe. And then, uh, okay, so that density is positive. And once you go to four or more squares, then, base, then every integer is represented. And okay, so in particular, the density of represented sums of four squares is, or more is one. Okay, so so basically, I mean, the point is that the, the more variables you have, the easier it is to solve these equations because there's more room to find solutions. Uh, so another way to say this is the critical kind of case where the number of variables equals the degree, so k equals two, the equation x squared plus y squared equals n, this has, uh, if you average over n, this will typically have like on a constant number of solutions on average. Um, some geometry elementary geometry of numbers argument and uh the fancy way to say this is that this equation x squared plus y squared equals n is a log colabial variety um and let me briefly discuss the kind of maybe an algorithmic point of view on these topics so the the kind of algorithmic difficulty of solving this equation x squared plus y squared equals n is maybe comparable to another Send it kind of two variable quadratic equation that's famous the, the factoring equation, namely to try to find non trivial solutions x and y such that x, y equals n. But yeah, I mean, just like factoring in special cases, this uh, equation is uh, can be efficiently solved in polynomial time. Like if n is a prime that can be represented as a sum of two squares, then you can actually find those x and y efficiently using, say, continued fractions or elliptic curves or other tools. Um, this is due to the references at the, on the bottom. And building on this um, sum of two squares equation for primes, Rabin and Shallot were able to at least heuristically give an efficient algorithm for solving the three squares equation, um, x squared plus y squared equals n for all n when they, when they exist. But this is, this, uh, is only possible because there are many more solutions than in the kind of critical case x where there are, you know, the number of x plus y squared equals n. Okay, but, but those last two points were kind of just for fun. So now I want to move on to the main topic, which is uh, Diophantine problems, especially cubic ones in three and six variables. I'll explain why it's these two uh, variables. Basically, we'll have statistical results in three variables and, and kind of like full not statistical result in six variables. So for simplicity, I will work over a function field K of the form FQ adjoined T. So rational function field in one variable where FQ is a finite field. And uh, since I'm doing cubic problems, it'll be kind of convenient to assume that the characteristic of this finite field is at bigger than three. So Q is a prime power where the prime is bigger than three. Um, right, so many kind of classical problems over the integers, irrational numbers have natural analogs over the function fields. Uh, in particular, the integers here are analogous to the polynomials inside K, namely FQ uh, bracket T. Um, so this is like the ring of integers of this uh, fraction field K. So uh, yeah, so the advantage of working over a function field is that there are more tools available. For example, the Riemann hypothesis is uh, proven over function fields for arbitrary L functions, and that's basically due to Deline's resolution of the vague conjectures. And okay, so what these L functions are 
valuable for Diophantine problems because they kind of glue together a lot of local data on say point counts modulo different primes. And uh, a famous example of their Diophantine relevance is the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture or BSD for short on elliptic curves, which connects this uh, like the L function has to be L function L S E associated to an elliptic curve to the group of rational points E of K for uh, yeah. So, so this is for any elliptic curve over like a global field, like uh, for example, K. Um, so this has to be L function, which I'll kind of say more about on the next slide. It packages together all these local point counts into a single object while the group E of K is about global, like actual rational points over K. So the BSD conjecture is that the kind of order of vanishing, the analytic rank of LSE at the central point equals the algebraic rank of this group E of K. So local to global kind of principle. Okay, so uh, the way these L functions are defined is for simplicity, let me focus on the case of interest in this talk, which will be, let's say we have a smooth projective hypersurface H over this function field K. And concretely, like the simplest examples, if you want, are diagonal equations like A1, X1 cubed plus dot 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 plus AN, XN cubed. So say N variables, say a homogeneous cubic equation or any other degree is also fine. And the coefficients A1 through AN are all uh, non-zero elements of your uh, field, function field K. So at every uh, prime pi of your function field, so you, you, I mean, if you scale a prime by like a scalar in FQ, then it doesn't change like the uh, arithmetic there. So to normalize things, I'll just, cons primes will basically correspond to monic irreducible polynomials for me. Um, Okay, so for each monic irreducible polynomial pi, you can count, you can kind of study the geometry of H when you reduce it mod pi in a suitable sense. And that will give you your local factor of this, uh, of, of your uh, passive L function, which I'll call L pi of S, uh, L pi of SH. And uh, the cleanest case to define this is when uh, at primes of like good reduction, basically. So if 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 you can uh, if if you have a prime pi that does not defy the discriminant of H, in other words, where H is non-singular modulo pi, then uh, the L function L pi s the the factor L pi s H is given by a product of you know one over one minus some things, where the number of things is some classical Betty number. Like it, it'll won't depend on it will just depend on uh, h and not on pi. So let me call that uh, number b sub h. Then you'll have a bunch of these factors like one minus something, and then it will be like some alpha j pi. These are like the Satake parameters, and their sizes are in this case they're all on the unit circle by the Bay conjectures. And concretely, what these are is in terms of point counts is you look at the number of points h in some field f pi r, that's a like degree r extension of the residue field of pi, and then compare it. You might ex naively expect it to look like the number of points in a projective space of the same dimension, but then there will be an error term, and that's what is given by the Bay conjectures and the resolution. So if you kind of do a square root normalization, so divide by the square root size, then you will get um, minus one to the, by the left-shift trace formula, you'll get minus one to the dimension of H times a sum of these, like uh, these Frobenius eigenvalues, alpha J pi to the R. So the, this, this formula works for any degree R and that any degree R extension of your residue field. And that determines the numbers alpha J. So, so I've normalized it. So they're all of size one. So it's sort of analogous to like the classical Riemann zeta function, if you're uh, familiar with that. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, okay. So you can also with more work define these local factors at the primes where pi divides the discriminant, but this is 
defining it for almost all primes. So that's, uh, let me just focus on that. Okay, so these are the local factors. And then um, the global Hasse L function is just what you get by multiplying all of these local factors together. So it, it, incorporate, it, so it incorporates all the different primes pi that we saw on the last slide. Um, and okay, so another way to think about L functions more globally uh, is to, I mean, LS, this LSH, basically what it does is it captures the geometry of some higher dimensional variety, namely, let me call it like H total, which is basically what you get by when you think of H, but like with T as an additional variable. So for example, if H is this hypersurface a1 x1 cubed plus dot dot plus a n x n cubed, where a1 through a n are elements of your function field, then you can also think of you know a1 through a n as I mean they lie in this f q t cross, so they're basically fu rational functions of t. So you can also think of all like pairs x and t over f q such that this equation a1 t plus x1 cubed plus dot dot plus a n t x n cubed equals zero satisfied. Um, that's like when basically the advantage of working over the function field that you have this additional variable t that lets you connect the global L function to geometry as well. Okay, so um, using this kind of, and this geometry kind of sheds light on the glo global L function, which is something we're still missing in the, you know, number field case or classical case. Okay, so, but anyways, um, I want to talk more about families of L functions rather than just individual L functions. And um, this is because in practice, L functions don't just live in isolation, but can be like they, they naturally live in families. And a conject conjectures of Kat Sarnak, uh, and then further developed by Keating, Snaith, and others. And these are kind of informed by the geometry of this H total kind of that I mentioned on the last slide. They suggest that as your like hypersurface or variety varies, this its L function LSH should resemble the characteristic polynomial of a random n by n matrix A uh, from some classical group, where n is roughly of size log of the uh, discriminant of H. So here the discriminant of H will be some rational function of T. So it will be some element of K. And then the absolute value I use here is the like Q to the degree of the discriminant. So log Q of the size is just the, so all I mean is N is roughly the degree of the dis discriminant as a uh, polynomial in T. So, okay, so this N measures the complexity of H and then in natural families, um, You'll you should as H varies, you would expect this uh, characteristic polynomial to kind of be random. So this is like a random matrix theory prediction, and it has been uh, greatly, I guess, enhanced by subsequent work of Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, Snaith, uh, developing the integral moments conjecture, and then further by Conry, Farmer, Zirnbauer on the ratios conjecture, and then other, for example, Andrade and Keating have extended that to the function field setting. And this, okay, so this gives the moments and ratios conjectures. And basically the advantage of these conjectures is that they are kind of arithmetically a lot friendlier uh, to work with than the original random matrix theory predictions, even though the original ones are kind of the, the impetus for these uh, newer conjectures. So yeah, so here is one kind of classical famous application of this kind of random matrix theory prediction. Uh, basically due to Kat Sarnak, uh, or like it's in their bulletin paper on the subject. And then maybe I'm going to state it in a way using the ratios conjecture. So that would be building on these two other papers I mentioned, CFKRS and then uh, subsequent works as well. So uh, basically assume like a random matrix ratios conjecture, namely like a random matrix theory type prediction for a certain ensemble of L functions. Um, let's say we're interested in the family of elliptic curves E sub N defined by X cubed plus Y cubed equals N times Z cubed. Uh, so this is an elliptic curve over K because I, like, I'm gonna assume N is non-zero here, 
then this is an elliptic curve over k because uh, you know it has a it's a homogeneous cubic equation and three variables and it has a rational point one minus one zero. Um, so yeah, okay. So in this elliptic curve, we can look at its Hasselbein L function L S E N as we saw on previous slides, and then you like assuming these random matrix theory. Uh, predictions for what these L functions look like as N varies. So in this case, specifically, you're interested in kind of zeros um, the, near the central point. So that will be, you'll be interested in the ratio L prime over L of these functions, L functions as N varies. Um, okay, so if you assume this, then you get some really nice consequences. Namely, you get that the Burton Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, as well as Goldfeld's conjecture on the equidistribution of ranks, namely that half of these elliptic curves should have rank zero and half of them should have rank one, that will hold for, I mean, maybe not all, but at least a density one, but the proportion one of these curves, E sub n. Um, right, so this is an application of, from, of L functions to rational points, and it proceeds basically through uh, the like structure of uh, these elliptic curves, for example, work of uh, like uh, Gross Zagier and Coley Wagen proving some special cases of the Burton Swinner Dyer conjecture. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, okay, so, so th this is, there's nothing really special about this cubic twist family E sub n that I mentioned here. This, I mean, similar kind of results hold for most families of elliptic curves. Um, but this is a really kind of robust result. But in each case, the kind of group structure of and the kind of the fact that the equation is homogeneous, so it's really about rational points. It, that's kind of these things are really essential to the uh, for this kind of argument to work. And the main topic of today is I'm going to change the n times z cubed to a minus sign, and that makes the problem much harder because now it's really about integral points and there seems to be no like convenient structure like in BSD or anything like that. Okay. Um, but we'll still like prove something that look kind of similar to this result. Uh, so, but yeah, as I said, this is gonna be less direct because there's not something like BSD that we can try to, uh, there's no structure that we can really pass through. So instead of directly working with some L functions uh, connected to the Diophantine equations directly that we're interested in, namely these sum of three cubes equations, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals n, we need to work with some fancier varieties. So these will be, I'll say more about these as we go on, but let me just define them right now. So these will be the L functions LSC of a certain family of varieties, very explicit varieties, uh, these, hyperplane sections c dot x of this uh, Fermat four cubic four surf, uh, hypersurface x1 and six variables. So x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus the, the dot x6 cubed equals zero. And then slice it with uh, c dot x. So here I just mean c1 x1 plus the usual dot product c1 x1 plus c2 x2 plus dot dot, dot c6 x6 equals zero. Uh, so for each variety, just like for I mean, these are basically hyperplane. These are basically hypersurfaces because once, if you slice a hypersurface by like a linear equation, that's basically another hypersurface. Once you change variables, so the same definition of Hasselbein all functions I gave earlier applies here. And these will be kind of, uh, as I said, we want to work. This, these all functions really make sense only for smooth varieties, so we want some discriminant to be non-zero. But basically, most uh, tuples C, C C one through six will have non-zero discriminants. So uh, this is just a small thing. Okay. So the point is, assume that the uh, assuming that the like this random matrix theory type prediction, the ratios conjecture holds for this uh, new ensemble of L functions L S C, and specifically, we'll be interested in kind of these negative second moments, one over L S one C times one over L S C two, uh, L S two C. Um, so I'll, I'll state what this ratio signature says precisely on the next slide, but the idea is it's a random matrix theory prediction for this family. 
so assuming this kind of, then you can show that x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals n is soluble uh, in FQT for a positive density of uh, n. You don't um, get you don't get full density. Uh, so that's uh, that's work in progress, but we just wrote up this simpler version first. Um, it should be possible also to get density one. Uh, and there are no local obstructions in this in this case. Uh, yeah, thanks. So okay, but one thing I mean th this current result is also it goes in a different direction as well. It's more robust in that let's say you wanted to solve your equations in the like wearing type uh, situation where you might restrict your variables to be monic or something like that. That's the analog of like making re requiring your variables to be positive. So uh, I mean, in these kind of smaller sets, density one is simply not true. Um, but as I said, if you want to get density one, then it should be possible with more work. But we, yeah, you do need to require, allow your kind of variables to not just be monic, but they might be not uh, any polynomials. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to talk about this positive density result today because it's uh, cleaner, but as the methods should also work for density one with more work. Um, but yeah, our paper on this positive density one should come out tomorrow, I think. So, um, and th then we'll work on density one after that. Um, okay, great. So let me say a little bit more about the ratios conjecture. So the precise hypothesis is it will involve some standard like arithmetic factor A, S1, S2, which is absolutely convergent in the interesting past the critical line. So let me just not say much about that. That's not really the main content of this conjecture. So that's that's a part of kind of well understood part. So the main thing is um, there basically we want, I mean, when, when you, okay, when you study one over an L function, you have to be careful because it's the L, the L function has zeros on the critical line. So you have to shift away from the critical line. And then you, uh, so let's say we're on the line one half plus beta, where beta is positive. And I'll let it uh, basically think of beta as a small positive constant, but you could also let it uh, vary with Z somehow. Uh, then basically what what we need is that this mean value of one over L S one C times L S C two, we want an asymptotic formula for the, for this mean value. And so what it looks like, and this is basically standard in the ratios conjecture, it will look like a bunch of uh, kind of, so we're on the line one half and then you'll see a bunch of, we see a bunch of polar terms, P of S1, P of S2, Zeta, S1 plus S2. These are things that uh, like really on the line one, right? Cause S1, like S1 plus S2 will be on the line one plus two beta, two S will be on the line one plus two beta, S plus one half will be on the line uh, one, sorry, one, one plus beta. So, so all these are close to the line one. So these are really well understood things but they do capture some in interesting like log type behavior and so on. Um, and then, okay, so we also need to include some error term. Um, it's we, for our application, we need some particular dependence on this with beta, but it's like actually weaker than what the ratios conjecture predicts. The ratios conjecture, so the ratio conjecture certainly predicts this and more. It predicts that uh, like for any beta, say bigger than one over Z say, that's, but you could also just think of beta as being some uh, small constant. Then you can imp actually take this power saving six beta Z to be any fixed constant omega, like some small fixed constant power saving omega Z with omega independent of beta. Um, so this is certainly falls under the ratios conjecture. And then uh, the next thing I want to discuss is uh, some recent developments on the ratios conjecture. Uh, so a recent breakthrough in homological stability by Bergstrom, Diakonu, Peterson, and Westerlund last year. And this year, like last week by Miller, Pats, Peterson, Randall Williams on the archive 
they've resolved the kind of, let's say, ith moments conjecture for quadratic Dirichlet L functions. So these are a little bit simpler, but they're still like of the same kind of geometric type as what I'm interested in, the LSCs. Um, okay, so the moments conjecture is kind of the opposite conjecture. It's where instead of Ls in the denominator, you have Ls in the numerator. Okay, so you're like Ls chi d to the ith power or something like that. So they resolve this with a uniform power saving independent of I. So it's kind of like getting this omega type that's independent of uh, beta here. It's independent of I in their setting. And, but they do this like, I guess under a Q restriction. So the Q has to be large enough in terms of the moment I in question. Um, so it's, I guess, yeah. So I think, I mean, I think Dan Peterson will be giving a talk later this semester and you can say much more about this, but let me just say, mention some of the ingredients, not all. Some of the ingredients in the proof are exponential Betty bounds um, as opposed to say super exponential Betty bounds um, and a linear stability range for the cohomology of certain uh, local systems associated to certain symplectic local systems. Um, I guess Sarnak kind of calls this topology beyond the vague conjectures, and I, I kind of like that, so I wrote that here. Uh, basically, the point is that it's using monodromy groups in a, or monodromy representations in a kind of even deeper way than has been used in the past. So like Deline in his proof of the vague conjectures used monodromy groups in a, over certain families of L functions in an essential way. Um, and like, for example, Katz has built on that beautifully to tackle other questions. For example, the computing moments of Klosterman sums and things like that. Um, on the other hand, it seems that in these examples, uh, the notion of the like monodromy group is much coarser than what is used in these uh, new results by Miller, Pats, Peterson, and Randall Williams, uh, which really uh, kind of bootstraps from deep automorphic results on the cohomology of arithmetic groups by Burrell. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really exciting new direction. Let me just uh, briefly mention two things before moving on. One is that, so I got an email earlier from Diakono this week who suggested that uh, maybe if we had better Betty balance, for example, like polynomial or sub exponential, maybe that could help to remove this Q bigger than like I kind of restriction. Um, on the other hand, yeah, so I, I don't know the status of that. So presumably exponential is the best known at present, but it would be very interesting to determine what are the best Betty bounds possible. Um, okay, the final thing I want to briefly mention is uh, since we're interested in the ratios conjecture, um, so yeah, I, I have a kind of short semi-expository note on the archive earlier this week, explaining how this uh, breakthrough can be extended to the case of the ratios for these quadratic L functions. Let's say you have I L functions in the numerator and J L functions in the denominator. And again, you need to restrict the uh, like shift uh, in the denominator. So let's say we restrict the real part of S at least one half plus beta then as long as Q is big enough in terms of I, J, and beta, then you can kind of do this with a uniform power saving independent of I, J, and beta. So this is kind of analogous to the moments independent of I thing, as long as Q is large enough. So this is indeed, this is the kind of result that would suffice. Uh, it, this would prove the conjecture on the last slide for large enough Q, uh, for, certainly. But it remains a very interesting open problem to prove the necessary Betty bounds and stability. Of course, the, uh, yeah, so this is a very new territory. It's not really clear uh, the difficulty, but it's I think it's uh, very interesting. Okay. So, yeah, so I mean, maybe a brief comments about the proof of this result uh, is that it uses kind of the Lefschetz trace formula to re-express uh, these statistics of L functions as uh, using the, in terms of traces as an alternating, like sum of traces of Frobenius on certain cohomology groups. And then you need kind of two things to control these cohomology groups. One is you would like to understand the cohomology groups near the top very well. That's what the stability range does. And then the other ones, you just want to bound for those. And those you use, you do, you do using Deline's resolution of the way conjectures plus 
and uh, the these kind of exponential Betty number bounds for the sizes of the cohomology groups. So it's combining those two ingredients that makes it work. And okay, let me also mention that, uh, so like this is for a geometric family, like uh, these Dirichlet L functions, but for harmonic families, uh, Will Sawan has also proven, basically proven like most of the ratios conjecture for, I, I mean, in this, with this Q, kind of Q restriction for certain harmonic families, for example, if you look at like, uh, I mean, yeah, so, so different, a character with a fixed conductor or something like that. But um, yeah, so it seems that the ratios conjecture is starting to become within reach for more general families as well, but it remains to be done. But okay, so let me return to the uh, what I've done with, you know, Browning and Glass. So I want to give some background on sums of three cubes. Let me focus on the integer case for now, though the situation, like, because it's more classical and more well-known, but I imagine that the situation over FQT should be similar because these are all like very, they, usually these kinds of problems are not out, outrageously easier over function fields. They're still very sparse and difficult. So, okay, anyway, Mordell in 1953, he suggested that maybe producing large general, say, like not in these special families of solutions that you can sometimes find. The if producing these large general solutions to the sum of three cubes equation should be as hard as like proving that pi is normal or something like that. So um, maybe it's just like some impossible statistical problem. And specifically asked whether, you know, three can be written as a sum of three cubes and more than the two small solutions that were known for a long time. And okay, as I said, these are supposed to be very rare solutions because this equation is log Kalabi Yao. And beautifully, and this has been talked about in a uh, past number three web seminar, I think by Sutherland, the uh, Booker found a solution for 33 that is very difficult because there's no structure basically. And 42 is even harder, but he did it with Sutherland. And then the three was find solving Mordell's question was even, even harder and required a bit of luck this last, yeah, so uh, anyway, but I think I just want to illustrate difficulty. So we're going to concentrate not on individual equations, but on statistics. And the statistical idea, let me just briefly recap. So it's based, it's a kind of analog of this familiar linear algebra trick. If you have like a linear map between two finite dimensional vector spaces, that's kind of as injective as possible, then it has to be surjective. This is usually, so this, we, we do this a lot in uh, analysis, the second moment method, which is the statistical analog of this trick, using Cauchy Schwartz to double the number of variables in a problem. So for example, if you have F a cubic form in four variables with non-zero discriminant, then uh, Browning and Visha proved uh, Manin's conjecture of, like for this doubled hy hypersurface, so eight variables, f of x equals f of y um, away from some concrete locus, friendly locus. So what this means is basically that the fibers of f are controlled in mean square. And uh, okay, so this implies by this second, mo this is kind of saying that f is close to like as injective as possible on average. So this kind of uh, the second moment method, so, so if you set up some counting function, use cauchy schwartz in the right way, this will show that the number of f that, such that rf, this representation function is non-zero, will have a positive density. Um, so kind of the first moment is easy to compute, the second moment is upper bounded by the browning Visha results. Okay, so we're going to do, uh, this is a classical strategy, we're going to do something similar. So if you want to produce sums of three cubes, it is enough to control the second moment, and that second moment will correspond to a six variable equation, sum of three cubes equals sum of three cubes. Um, so let me just briefly mention the best unconditional results over the integers are due to Vaughn and Woolley. But um, yeah, so I will concentrate on the FQT case where there are uh, better results known. And I will explain why. Uh, so specifically, we will be interested, let me, for convenience, change variables and move all of these variables onto one side. So I'm going to replace u with minus u, minus v, minus w to get all variables on one side. So then 
we'll be interested in the six variable cubic f equals sum of six cubes. And specifically, we're interested in nfb, which is the number of x uh, such that you know all of their degrees say are of, are b and f of x equals zero. So we want to count the number of solutions to this. And we specifically, we would like to show that nfb is uh, goes at most like q to the three times b. So I will first discuss some conjectures on this topic and then uh, results on this topic. So the basic prediction is the hardy littlewood prediction that NFB should grow like a product of local densities times Q to the B times six minus three. So this that six is the number of variables. Three is kind of how difficult it is to solve a cubic equation. So Q to the three B is the expectation naively. Um, but the point is this constant in front is kind of subtle. And, uh, and it, I mean, in the hardy little prediction, it's a simple constant. It's just the product of local densities measuring the biases of these equations at different places. But Hooley showed that this, at least over the integers, Hooley showed that this prediction is actually false. There are too many solutions that are not accounted by uh, that hardy little prediction. Namely, I mean, there are also these kind of structured or linear solutions, right? Like if you want to make f equals sum of six cubes equals zero, one way to do it is just like pair up the variables and set those equal to zero. So there are also like q to the three b on the order of q to the three b of those kinds of solutions. And Hooley, Manin, and so on, they've suggested that perhaps you should just add up those two terms, the kind of hardy little randomness prediction plus the kind of structured linear solutions plus an error term. And the this the difficulty of this conjecture, I mean, which is reflected in the fact that the two main terms are kind of completely different and of the same order of magnitude, the difficulty is that it kind of lies beyond uh, the classical circle method. If you try to write it as an integral and then apply certain, like by some estimates, you can't, you can't even in principle do that because of this square root barrier. You can't do better than square root cancellation point wise. But the, I mean, this uh, Klosterman method, which I will discuss soon, um, it sort of kind of dually expresses your point count. So, so it kind of harmonically decomposes the difficult part in, in a nicer, uh, in another way. So it kind of opens the door to progress. So it no longer uses point, gives up kind of point wise vial bounds. And it really uses a lot of averaging. Um, and okay, so let me also mention that we're only going to be interested in second moments, so the six variable point count. But if you're interested in higher moments and other statistics, you can see work of Desiree, uh, and Eckhart, and Lindro. And I think Desiree has given a web seminar talk on this before. Okay, so what is known now using this method, um, which builds on work of Hooley and Heath Brown, it's known that the NFB is at most Q to the three plus epsilon times B. So it seems that we're pretty close to what we want, which is Q to the three times B. Here, epsilon can be anything. And what this uses is GRH for the L functions that we mentioned earlier, associated to these hyperplane sections VC. Um, yeah, so, Here's what the Klosterman method is roughly. So these L functions first came up in work of Hooley over the rationals, but I'll kind of explain it over the function field instead. So basically you use the circle method. You want to write your point count as a certain Fourier integral. Then you break up the cir circle that you're integrating over into arcs. Uh, so don't worry too much about the parameters, but the point is, okay, so you have, you you your arcs are kind of, they have these approximated by these very fractions like AA over R, where R has kind of some bounded size, Q to the three B over two. And then what you do is you kind of average over these arcs as much as possible. So in particular, you can average over the numerators A associated to any given denominator R over your circle. That already helps a lot, but we want to go further and we'll also average over R. So the point is that you, you have this difficult counting question that you express as some average in terms of uh, some average of certain nicer quantities over moduli r up some size. 
And instead of summing over X of size, you know, uh, Q to the B, now we'll have a dual sum over size C uh, up to Q to the B over two, which is shorter. So there's a Poisson summation argument here somewhere. So eventually these multiplicative quantities that you get, they are connected to one over L as I'll explain on the next slide. And this can be bounded under G GRH for a real part of S bigger than a half. But one difficulty is that these L, one, L functions are also coupled with kind of other subtle factors related to uh, this discriminant that I kind of mentioned earlier, kind of related to the singularities of these hyperplane sections VC. Um, now, eventually, uh, the, the near optimal bound um, follows from this method with uh, 3 plus epsilon. But a difficulty in kind of removing the epsilon is that there are many different sources of epsilon in this argument. Uh, so it's not just like uh, one thing that has to be fixed. Sev several things have to be resolved to remove the epsilon. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so more specifically what this method does um, is we have this point count NFB and we can write that as a dual sum over C up to some size Q to the B over two and moduli R up to some size Q to the three B over two. And it will involve oscillatory integrals I C R and exponential sums S C R. And yeah, so it will involve like a Fourier, it will be some Fourier transform, you see a plus C dot X. But the point is that this sum S C R, uh, it's kind of, multiplicative in R, and it also uh, relates to the geometry of uh, the geometry of these varieties VC that I mentioned earlier. So before proceeding, let me just briefly mention that, uh, you know, when you do, it's kind of well known that the central term C equals zero, it leads to this uh, Hardy-Littlewood prediction, but not the other term conjecture, not the other main term conjectured by, you know, Huli, Manin, and so on. So there's something uh, that needs to be explained from other parts of this expression uh, and more. So yes, as I said, these SCRs, you can see, I mean, F, Fx and C dot X, so somehow, yeah. So they're related to this geometry of the intersection of those two. And uh, Huli noted that if you properly normalize these exponential sums by square root heuristics, so R to the minus seven halves times SCR, then uh, this kind of resembles the coefficient of one over an L function. And where this comes from is that if you have, uh, yeah, it, I mean, if you look at S, this normalized sum, you can relate it to this point count by directly computing. And then when you apply the left jet's trace formula, there will be like a sign minus one to the three. And that's why you get uh, like, Mobius type thing instead of like, like one over L rather than L. Uh, okay. So it uses the fact that these varieties are odd dimensional. So yeah, as I said, you can use GRH to get square root cancellation over R. Uh, but I mean, there are other things you have to worry about too, but let me not explain those right now. Right. So what they get is this three plus epsilon um, unconditionally because GRH is known over function fields by Deleen. Um, but okay, there are other sources of epsilon and in particular, we haven't really discussed anything about the locus where the discriminant is zero. It turns out that you can unconditionally prove that that uh, gives delta C equals zero gives you the like actual full main term conjectured by Huli, uh, Mana and so on. And the reason in a nutshell for this is that whereas we previously saw that these normalized sums are typically of size one, um, if the discriminant is you know, non-zero mod P, if the discriminant is zero, then actually you typically have a bias. These sums are a bit bigger, like by pi to the one half than you would expect. And somehow that bias kind of adds up through the delta, through, through, the, through the circle method eventually to uh, give you the main term conjectured from these special solutions, like the special linear solutions 
in the uh, six variable equation. And okay, so ultimately this kind of bias, it comes from results of Beauville on certain quadric bundles. Both, uh, we use it twice actually, once for surfaces, once for convex. So what it what remains is to analyze this locus where delta C is non-zero. And uh, we would basically like to use the ratios conjecture. Um, a difficulty is that like L function, the function field case, uh, they're a bit, they carry a bit less information. You don't have tools like partial summation available in any natural way. But a beautiful symmetry observation kind of lets you factor out this integral in dyadic ranges. And what that leads to is to estimating sums like this. So by dyadic decomposition, we want to estimate sums like sigma b n0 n1 of this, you know, with this integral factored out. And then you split the moduli r into two parts, one for the kind of singular moduli that are divis divide the discriminant and the others that are kind of relatively primed to this one. So those kind of behave rather differently. And okay, so Glass and Hockfield said what they showed is that each of these individual dyadic sums is has like three plus epsilon size. And then what we do is we remove the epsilon and also improve this estimate in two other aspects. We uh, kind of get decay in this like bad modulus uh, size parameter n0, and also in this uh, this other parameter, 3b over 2 minus n0 minus n1. So when these are tiny, we use the ratios conjecture mostly and other L functions techniques to get the desired like cancellations. But other in general, we need other ideas based on the size and factorization of discriminants, which is a kind of new inputs. So let me just say briefly, because then uh, maybe short on time. So if, for example, one of the ingredients we use besides ratios is we prove some analog of the Sarnak tree density hypothesis um, to handle certain kind of failures of a Ramanujan type conjecture for square root cancellation. And the ingredients in that are uh, like kind of basically uh, range for example, they include work of Hooley establishing square root cancellation for, you know, not just what the vague conjectures give you, which is for smooth varieties, but even for mildly singular varieties. And then also uh, work on Bouze and John Liu on discriminants, Poonin on the square free sieve, and Ekadol on the geometric sieve. Okay, and then the way we apply the ratios conjecture is like, okay, so there you can show that with some work, like by Poincaré duality and such, you can approximate these uh, S, these normalized exponential sums, their Dirichlet series at good primes. You can approximate it well by one over L times, but you need to go even further than Hooley did. You need to introduce a further fa correction factor related to like Shebyshev's bias and so on, things like that. So this will be, um, this P of S that we saw earlier when I formulated the ratios conjecture. And the point is that when you plug in the ratios conjecture and kind of do a suitable averaging and contour shifting argument, you eventually get a log free square root cancellation bound for these uh, S tilde C, these normalized exponential sums. And that's kind of, uh, as you see, that, that, that's why we can remove, one of the reasons we can remove this epsilon from this glass and hot filter, but we need the other ingredients too. Yeah, so, so let me just uh, and su summarize briefly. So yeah, so here's the main result again. We assume this ratios conjecture for some family L functions, so some standard random matrix theory type prediction. Then we get this positive density and the proof combines kind of different biases and cancellations that go kind of beyond the vague conjectures. There's this uh, like Beauville result that gives you local biases on the boundary delta equals zero. And then we also did other a lot of other things to handle cancel like establish cancellations near the boundary, and then the maybe you also need these uh, global cancellations when the discriminant is close to square free and maximal size, and that's uh, where we have no other tools. We need the ratios conjecture, and probably it should 
as Sarnak says, be some kind of topology beyond the vague conjectures. So uh, yeah, let me stop there. Um, thank you very much for listening.